first episode of the second season of Babylon with Vampa. I'm your host, Vampa. If this is your first time joining us, this is the show where I rule about town, Vampa Delombra, and my lovely co-host, Ed McMahon. Hey, hey! Chat with filmmakers, musicians, actors, artists, comedians, and any other type of creative person I can summon to my lair. If you are a repeat viewer, welcome back. I hope you're not too shy to push my buttons, specifically the like and subscribe ones. And if you enjoyed the past season of the show, please consider subscribing to our Patreon. You'll get all sorts of exclusives, like early access to the videos, and you'll also be privy to our new series, Vampus Viewings, where myself and a guest talk movies. We would love to be able to consider you. One, One of us. us. One, One of us. us. One of us. Now, before I bring out my guest, Dad and I want to introduce you to a new segment of the show that we're going to call Ask Dad. Now, you might remember from the first season, every week I ask Dad how his week is going. And he's, he's got a lot of problems. He's really sick of answering that question. So we decided to put the call out to you, the viewers, to find out what you want to know about our mysterious disembodied skull pail. So our first question comes from past Babylon guests, uh, the band Recreational Sacrifice, and they ask, Dad, what's your favorite board game? My favorite board game? Well, that would have to be Operation. Reason being, I love unnecessary surgery. Oh, boy. Don't, I mean, don't we all? And that's a really fun game. Wait a second, Dad. You don't have hands, so how do you even... How does that work for you? How do you play? Oh, that's simple. I just grip the tweezers in between my teeth. Yikes, Dad. Wow. How's your accuracy with that? I win every time. Ooh, most impressive. Well, I just can't wait to hear the rest of the questions that our, our viewers have for you, Dad, and I, I really can't wait to hear your answers. If you're watching out there and you have that question burning for Dad, let us know. Hook up with us on Instagram or Facebook and ask. And your question just might be answered on the show. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the first guest of season two to the lair, musician, composer, and one-third of Voyager 3, Steve Green. Hi, Steve. Hello. Thank you so much for coming down to the lair. Hope it wasn't too hard to find. We're kind of tucked away and hell down here. Right, right. No, I, it, was, it was a journey. I lost two good henchmen, but I still have my battle axe outside the door. I'm good. Cool, cool. Yeah, we don't, we don't allow weapons in here. You have to leave them. That's right. It's checked at the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, uh, first thing I want to say is I just watched uh, New York Ninja la a couple nights ago and um, kind of wild, fun movie. But, yes, you're um, a better person for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I felt it. I totally felt it. Um, the band, your band, Voyager 3, did the film score to this. Yes, indeed. We time traveled back to 1984 with our synthesizers, guitar and drums, and, and honed a, a, uh, a proper film score for John Liu's final film that he did. Yeah, yeah that was his final film. Wow, I didn't, I, I kind of looked at, I never had heard of him before this. Right on. And I kind of looked at, looked it up a little bit, and yeah. Um. Yeah, he did tons of films in the... I know 70s for sure, uh -huh. but it might have been a tiny bit in the early 60s where he was just starring or co-starring in, in, in the films. And they were mainly mm -hmm. films uh, in like Taiwan or China or areas like that. Never an American picture. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the late 70s into the early 80s, he decided, I want to start making my own films. I've starred in tons. I mm -hmm. want to start doing my own. So mm -hmm. there's before New York Ninja, there's actually three other films that he directed, he wrote it, and he starred in it. Um, and uh, New York Ninja was to be the fourth, first American filmed one. That, so he was trying to hit the American audience because if you can hit that, man, you got it. You yeah. know. So that that was his dream, I believe. Yeah, and he's still alive. I I saw. Um, where is he? Yeah, they tried to find him because um, the, the a lot of people don't know about it. But New York Ninja was a film that was shot in 1984. But before it could be completed and edited and all the stuff that happens when you finish a film, the, the production company went bankrupt. Oh, so wow. the, the movie just laid in limbo. It was never edited. Mm -hmm. So when Vinegar Syndrome acquired the film canisters for New York Ninja in like probably 2018-ish or 19-ish, mm -hmm. 
It was the unedited reels, the principal photography on a palette, probably 70 or 80 or more reels. Um, and uh, that's, that's where it left. That's it. So what, a, what a, a, a piece of work to get that finished into a film because all the sound got lost mm-hmm. and or was never filmed to begin with. Because a lot of those movies of that era and that genre didn't use sync sound. I, right. I know that you know that. Yeah. Um, so they would dub it in later anyway. Mm-hmm. But regardless of that, if that's how they were doing it or not, no audio was with the collection of, of material. No script. No call sheets. They didn't know the name of one actor except for John Liu because you would recognize him. Yeah. So it's silent picture. That's it. Wow. And they put that together and made a cohesive story. Unbelievable. Yeah, that, that had to have been like such a like unique undertaking. I, I can't even imagine. It's almost like you're doing like detective work to and, like yeah. to piece it all together to even figure out. I guess what the screenplay was supposed to be. Right. Yeah. Because you're so. guessing. You just you just have some indications by what they're doing but not necess- but somebody's actions wouldn't necessarily communicate exactly what was intended sometimes it does mm-hmm. but other times you'd be like yeah i know he walked through the door and he said something to the guy but i don't know what's really happening here mm-hmm. so this is what uh the 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 gentleman from vinegar oh let, let me mention vinegar syndrome is the company that acquired the film and finished it and mm-hmm. i think there's nobody better on the planet to have done that because they are f- a film preservation company first and then they release blu-rays and DVDs second. That's yeah. like my feeling for their list of of, of, of priorities. They want to save films, yeah. restore them, give them their justice, if you will, and everything like that. So uh, Curtis Spieler was the gentleman who redirected it, is what mm-hmm. they call it, um, and edited it. Mm-hmm. So he first went by the slate, because that's the only piece of data that remained, ah, is yeah. the slate at the beginning at of each shot. he has the order of the scenes. Right. But here's the funny part. When he put it together, according to that, mm-hmm. it didn't make any sense whatsoever. Oh. So he was like, at that point, he was like, I, I got to just kind of take this and do my own thing and, yeah. and me, have me make sense of it and, and organize it in a way that I think is a cohesive story. And I, in my opinion, I think that even though he had to do that, I feel like it couldn't be that much different mm-hmm. than the original film. Mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like he nailed the spirit of it. So, yeah. yeah, so after he edited it, he had to then be like studying the, the, the image and be like, I think they're saying that. So some things you'd be able to know what they're saying, mm-hmm. some things, because it's obvious on, on the actions and you can literally read their lips. So there's some of that. Mm-hmm. Then, unfortunately, there's some parts where the actor is not facing the camera talking. Oh. So then you have to be like, well, he did do and say this and then after that he did this. So I'm going to make up this middle part to get me to the next point, I feel like that's what he did. Yeah. And I think he did a great job. I, I, I wouldn't change anything, honestly. Yeah. So, but in answer to your initial question, uh, John Liu is alive and they tried to reach out to him mm-hmm. during the production mm-hmm. to ask for like help at all or did he want to be a part of it or anything like that. And it took them many, many weeks and months to get a hold of him because first they could not find him at all. Then there was this little rumor that came up that this person knows this person who visits John Liu every other month and brings him some things, maybe food or, or something yeah. from the mainland or whatever. Because mm-hmm. he lives on a boat in Vietnam, like a houseboat. This is what we were told. I don't know if, if this is legend or not yeah. or factual. I don't know that. But this is what I've heard is that he lives on a um, houseboat in Vietnam off the grid, kind of just like hermit style, mm-hmm. I guess, whatever. So... But word came back, though, to what I was told, that he said, I don't want to have anything to do with this, but good luck, and I give you my blessing. But me, personally, because I really love this movie, and I love movies of that era, and that genre, and that whole bubble of that time and everything, I want him to see it. Because I want him to know that it was finished. Even if it might not be exactly what he had in mind, um, Mm -hmm. I want him to see it and just know. He must have just closed the chapter on his life and was like, you know, I'm at peace with it not being done. And just because, I mean, I wouldn't be able to, like, rest if my movie wasn't finished. I know. But, I know. So that's, that's, that's pretty wild. Um, I want to talk to you more about the movie, but I want to save that for my uh, Patreon uh, subscribers. Uh, we're going to talk more about uh, on Bombas Viewings. But I do want to ask you, how did uh, Voyager 3 hook up with Vinegar Syndrome and get the opportunity to do this? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a cool story, too, because it, it, it all, when situations like this happen, it kind of 
lets you know you're doing the right thing. You're on the right path. You're, mm-hmm. You have a good synergy going. So we were on our way, actually, to um, play some shows with this excellent band from Toronto called Cybertronic Spree. They're a band that dresses up like the Transformers. And they, they have some of their original songs, but they also play all the songs from the 1984 film Transformers. Wow, that's really cool. All, all those Vince DiCola songs that, uh, that you know, it's kind of like a little progressive, a little 80s, a little rocky. Yeah. Because uh, Vince DiCola did some Rocky Four stuff and, mm-hmm. and other stuff, I believe. But uh, we, we did like a little short tour with them. And right before we were leaving for that, Vinegar Syndrome sent us an email saying, hey, would Voyager 3 be interested in scoring this film? I can't tell you that much about it, but it's a genre film, um, martial arts film from 1984. And I'm thinking to myself, this is what we were born to do. So, yes, we can do this. We'll figure out the details later. So then on the way to Chicago, the first date of that tour was Chicago. I told the guys about this. So, you know, Chicago, you got a four-hour and change driving up plenty of time to discuss and brainstorm yeah. and everything. So we were, we were like, they, were, they didn't understand quite what I was talking about. And, and they're like, wait, is it like a spoof movie? That's like it's supposed to feel like it's from that era? Because that's what a lot of people do nowadays, which is cool. Yeah. There's some that have nailed it. Like, um, well, Stranger Things is really good at that. And uh, mm-hmm. there's a movie called 1984, right? And it's got a milk carton on the cover, like Missing, it says on there. Isn't that called? Mm-hmm. Or Summer of 84, I I've think. Heard of oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. And then there's another one... Um, Lamatos did the soundtrack for it. It's called um, and uh, Michael Ironside stars in it. How come I can't remember the name of it? Shoot, we'll have to put text below. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the name of it now. Um, and they made a video game about it. Uh, I'll, I'll remember. I'll look it up. Yeah, I don't. Know but there's been a handful of these films that mm-hmm. uh, are supposed to feel like they were out sometime in the mid to late '80s, mm-hmm. uh, and they do a good job. But I, but I told the guys, no, this really is a film. It, I go, it never got finished. And at the time, I didn't know the whole story. But I'm like, I don't know why it's not finished. But they have it. And they want to finish it. Yeah. And they want us to do the music. And I'm like, we have to do this. This is perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really, like, unique just yeah. opportunity and, and unique like situation just in general. Yeah. I have never heard of another film that was done quite like this. Like, I know, like, Miami Connection mm-hmm. is about the closest kind of cousin of this, but that's a different story because Miami Connection was a finished film that got completed and released mm-hmm. in 1987. Mm-hmm. Uh, complete, done. And then it just didn't do well at the theater. It actually got panned very hard. They were very cr- uh, cruel to it, actually. Mm-hmm. It's another cheesy martial arts movie. Yeah. Um, but if you if you love that spirit and you know what they're trying to do, you, you, di- you just have to get it. And I think that y- 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 y'all are in that boat where you yeah, get that. Possibly. you know. Yeah. Um, but then... Like, uh, Alamo Draft House came across it, like, in 2011 or 2010, just a print that was floating out there. I think they bought mm-hmm. it off eBay, actually. Mm-hmm. And they watched it, and they're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. What is this film? I've never heard of it. Who did it? How can we get a hold of it? So they tried to call um, Y.K. Kim is the guy who directed and wrote that film, mm-hmm. Miami Connection. And at first, he thought they were just being silly and picking on him and trying to make fun of him. So he didn't return their calls, or he oh. told them, get out of here. No, <laughs> yeah. we know. But eventually they convinced him, no, no, we want to screen this at one of our festivals. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, he finally realized they weren't joking. And uh, so it screened at one of the, I don't remember which festival it was, but it's on the internet. You can find it. But it's, And people went nuts. And so fast forward a little mm-hmm. bit more time, they released it on its own Blu-ray. They put the soundtrack out on vinyl. Mm-hmm. And it's another little cult thing, kind of like New York Ninja. Yeah. But that was done, though. The New York Ninja constructed yeah. only a few years ago from all the principal photography from 1984. I've never heard of that. Yeah. It's so unique. You're right. And, and um, it kind of, I feel like, I, I hate to, to mention someone I don't like on my show, but um, it reminds me a little bit of like, a, it doesn't remind me of it. It's not like something like What's Up Tiger Lily or like, um, what's the name of that show? The most, I can't think of the name of the show, but it was a Japanese game show. Okay. But they used to. They had it on Spike TV, and they overdubbed it with like different words. Oh right, was it like a Ninja Warrior show? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Called Most Extreme Challenge. Yeah. I think I've seen one or two of those. So it's like you know, I, I kind of almost thought it was going to be something like that, where it's like, okay, obviously this is is that's not what they're saying. It's like played for jokes, but no, it, it wasn't. Right, that was something absolutely 
thought about, talked about, mm-hmm. and, and followed through with because we were going to do that no matter what. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't know if vinegar syndrome was going to kind of do the nod, wink, wink, nod, nod yeah. to the audience. Mm-hmm. Because look what we got here. You know, it's cheesy sometimes and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I didn't know how they were going to handle it because when we got the, the, the film to score to, there was no dialogue yet because all the dialogue mm-hmm. and Foley was done after we did our music, believe it or not. So I knew we were going to take it absolutely seriously and try to be like, follow the heart of like Ninja Three: the Domination or Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome or all those types of sweet films from that era mm-hmm. that weren't a joke. We yeah. were handling it earnest and trying to give it its, yeah. it, its due justice on, on, on being out and accepted and all that kind of good stuff. And then I was relieved when Curtis and I had one of our conversations and he was like, no, we're playing it straight, dude. We're going to do yeah. this like like we're trying to make a good movie like I think they were. And I'm like, sweet. Yeah. So good. I'm so I, glad I you said that. that. Comes through. Yeah. And I, I kind of wanted to ask you, like, um, so Voyager 3 did, um, has, a, has a couple of songs and a couple of soundtracks, uh, the documentary. Did you, yeah. did you write the song specifically for that documentary? Yeah, well, it was written specifically for that. It's not actually in the documentary film what they did. Uh, Lakeshore Records, who's responsible for tons of excellent soundtrack, uh, releasing soundtracks. Mm-hmm. Of uh, man, anytime you ever hear about anything that's good or hot on Netflix, like people are talking about it, and when you mm-hmm. finally check it out, you're like, yeah, it's awesome. And when you look to see who put the soundtrack out, it's always Lakeshore Records every mm-hmm. single time. So they did a companion album, a okay. two album companion album volume one volume two tons of like electronic uh synth wave all that bubble of uh of stuff like rise that of the f- synths. yes the rise the of the synths of um by um yvonne castell is is the director and writer's name of it and uh john carpenter did the narration for it so that's awesome to have him as a part of that because some people might not know that john carpenter scored most of his own movies because mm-hmm. to save money and to be quick about it and and get it done so all those classic John Carpenter films that we all love, that's him. And sometimes he had help from Alan uh, Holdsworth, or Alan Hallworth, actually. Um, so uh, um, it's great that those people were involved in this. But we did a song for the Companion album, and it was written specifically for that. Yep, It's called um, Appearance of the Mysterious Traveler, that, that, that track. Cool. Um, and then you also had two songs that uh, were written on your first album that ended up being on a soundtrack to the uh, short. Oh, that was a dream come true. Oh, yeah, my goodness. With yeah. Roddy Roddy Piper. Yeah, yeah. That that was cool because I actually did some scoring by myself on that mm-hmm. because of logistics and time and budget. They, they licensed two songs off of Doom Fortress, which is the mm-hmm. first Voyager 3 full length, as you said. Mm-hmm. And then there was still room left. That needed some score. So then mm-hmm. I just did some original score for that. Mm-hmm. There's probably like five or six cues for that, real okay. short, because the whole thing is only, I don't know, maybe it's nine minutes long or 12 minutes long, maybe, or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it didn't need a ton yeah. of music, but I kind of filled in some little gaps in, in, in there. So there is some actual original score, too. Okay. But where they put um, One's True Intentions and El Guantanero from the album perfect placement like when the door mm-hmm. keeps opening and it keeps hitting the that mellotron mm-hmm. chord again it's like repeat perfect it makes it funny and epic and scary because they can't close the portal and they're like, what are we gonna do it's I, on youtube by the way if you ever want to catch it I, I, i'm gonna do that yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's called uh portal, portal to, to hell. hell yeah yeah um, and that was roddy piper's last short film that he did before he passed away yeah wow yeah epic and sad at the same time yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of brought those up because I wanted to ask, like, how was that experience of scoring, like, a film like that different from doing this, the New York Ninja, where, I mean, did, you, you pretty much don't know what the plot is other than just watching the, like, mise-en-scene and the action and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, luckily with New York Ninja, by the time we got <clears throat> the, the, pick, the, the locked cut to, to score to, I did have a script okay. that okay. Curtis had wrote for it. So. When I would do a scene, like basically, we we did the score all during lockdown. Literally, mm-hmm. when it, when everything like when six ninety six was empty, yeah. not one car out there, for example. Mm-hmm. That was when we were doing like the heavy lifting of doing like all the um, spots and orchestration and and arrangement of all the parts. And that was mainly me at night. I would uh, I, I I would open up one scene in Pro Tools and read the script that 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 Curtis had and watch it two three times. Look at the script again. And start 
putting down a structure. And like by one o'clock in the morning or so, I would have an MP3 in the email to the guys mm -hmm. so that in the next three, four, five days a week or whatever, uh, Aaron, the guitar player, could start thinking, well, what am I going to play here? And then he'd start writing his part. And Greg could listen to the suggested drums. Sometimes I would suggest some drums. Sometimes I leave it open. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he would suggest something. It's all just whatever needs to happen, happens. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. But I would send these MP3s, sometimes one every single night. I've kind of went through this marathon, especially during lockdown. It was like a just a weird state of mind. I know you can oh, relate. Of course, just yeah. unlike any other time mm -hmm. in, in our lives. So I just focused on that mm -hmm. film score after the kids went to bed and uh, every, everything was handled. I would I would go to the studio and uh, and knock that out, and I would I would kind of clip through it as fast as I could, mm -hmm. and before you know it, there's 30 tracks uh, on that on that album. Well, it was actually 29, and then later on, um, when we were almost done doing our, our work for it, Curtis calls up and he goes, "Hey, the Vinegar Syndrome owners want a credit song with lyrics. Can you guys handle that?" And I'm like. I got you. So that's when the last track on the CD, This mm -hmm. Town Needs a Hero, Aaron sings that because all our old bands, uh, Decibel and Forge that we had all back in the day, Aaron was a singer. Mm -hmm. It just happens to be Voyager 3 is instrumental. So yeah. he just plays guitar now. But when a vocal thing came up, I, I knew the man to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's yeah. Cool. So at Vinegar Syndrome, one of their film scanners, his name is Brandon Upson, he was already a fan of Voyager 3. He had many of our other albums. So when New York Ninja came to the table and they were starting to discuss, hey, who's going to do the voices? Who's going to do the music? Brandon goes, this is what I'm told. Email Voyager 3, would you? So they did. And, 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 and I was told that there was maybe two or three other bands being, you know, talked about or, or, yeah. or, or, or discussed. But we locked that down. <laughs> yeah, good thing that they had him there because that was that was a good choice. I'm, yeah. I'm happy that he, guys, he knew you guys because, I, I mean... Yeah, and he owns really a <laughs> killer store in Connecticut called The Archive, mm -hmm. which has, I think it has two floors. I, I told him one of these days I'm going to surprise him and just go there and mm -hmm. just show up and go, what's up, Brandon? Um, but he has uh, VHS, Blu-rays, records, CDs, oh, cool. cassettes. It's just uh, this, the place that people like us would just love to hang out at all day, basically. Yeah. So if you're about in the Connecticut area, go to The Archive. The Archive, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. And then to answer your question about uh, Portal to Hell, believe it or not, the director, uh, Viviano Caldellini, was listening to Doom Fortress on his iPod as he was jogging mm -hmm. in Toronto. He, he lives in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And he, he, this is what he told me. He goes, I, I've been listening to Doom Fortress most days when I jog in the morning, and I got to have your music on Portal to Hell. And I'm like, you got it, man. <laughs> so That's cool. Yeah, it's very fun. For yeah, sure. I mean, you never know what kind of connections you're going to make just, right. you know, by, and who your fans are, you know. For sure. So that's, that's really cool. Um, so, I don't know, I don't think you answered this, but how, how would you compare, I, I think, like, um, scoring a movie, like, that is so unique, like New York Ninja, to the short that you did that, or any other movies that you've done that have yeah. been kind of modern and done? It, is there a difference at all, or is it just pretty much the same process? Yeah, my... Where my mind goes really is the same thing, just trying mm -hmm. to support the narrative that's mm -hmm. that's happening. I, I don't I don't want the music to get in the way, but I want to help it, help the scene, and be a little transparent. Mm -hmm. But you know, of course, the music is there, so people are going to hear it. So you yeah. you try to make it as as killer as you can without yeah. without being in the way, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's like a little balance. Sometimes you want to get louder when necessary. But then a mixer might knock it down anyway, so you don't know what's going to happen in, in, in right. the final thing anyway. But yeah. in my mind, I'm orchestrating the dynamics to what I think makes sense. But mm -hmm. in all honesty, with New York Ninja, nothing changed. It was exactly because what, what, when I deliver a score, I actually have the whole film open in Pro Tools and I drop in each cue where it was originally intended mm -hmm. to be for when I scored each scene separately. So I give them this like hour and whatever, 20 minute wave file yeah. that as long as the slate matches up in the beginning it's good mm -hmm. uh, and it was not touched you know of course there was fader writing and dialogue you know mixing of course mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. nothing else changed it, it was like as it was intended <laughs> wow that's really cool yeah um so voyager 3 also has a podcast called v3 and you guys talk about, I guess, like what's going on, like what you've watched, comic books, movies. The last one you did, you guys talked about Prey. Yeah, um, yeah, which was awesome, man. Oh, I really yeah. enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that one, too. And yeah. I, 
I have not seen any of the other Predator movies. I live with a, a Predator fan, I, and I don't know <laughs> why I've never watched it with him. It's right just one of the ones that that passed by. Gotcha, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, There's always yeah. one of those, like film or albums. Like, I, I, I'll be the first to tell you, as, as much as people love Frank Zappa and mm-hmm. talk about him, I missed the boat, but yeah. I know that it's there for me when I'm ready to dive in. It's all there, yeah. mm-hmm. but I don't really know more than about four or five Frank Zappa songs, and I like them, but I just I haven't jumped on that train yet. Yeah. So I get it. I get yeah. it. It takes me a long time sometimes to, to you know it's on my list, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we we checked out Prey and uh, yeah, I really like that. But um, back to, back to, to <laughs> you. Um, so, uh, you guys started that podcast last year, right? Yeah, yeah. V3 Cast is a blast. It's here's the the main motivation I think that is why we did it. One is I think with with COVID and everything that that's been happening, shows are either a inexistent or b very thin. Like since COVID is ramp, is ramped down now and the numbers are better and people feel a little bit safer, I, I believe. Mm-hmm. We've only done two shows. Mm-hmm. We did. Um, Last Devil's Night with Twisted at Halloween, uh, or Devil's Night um, at St. Andrew's Hall. They, they call it Fright Fest, and they do one every year. 2021? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we did one show then, and then we just did a show last month at Motor City Nightmares, which is one of the best horror cons in the Midwest, in my yeah. opinion. So we did their after party on Friday night. That's only two shows that we've done since all this happened. Mm-hmm. So we thought... This is a kind of a cool way to kind of keep in touch with people who care about us at all, you know. Yeah. Um, and we kind of do this at rehearsal, honestly. Like mm-hmm. in between songs or when we first get to rehearsal, we kind of do this exact same thing that's mm-hmm. on V3Cast. But we're like, maybe somebody might want to hear this. So we gave it a try. And, and it, was, it was decent feedback. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was more than, than seven views. So we're like, maybe, maybe people care about this a little bit. So we yeah. just kept going. It's fun. Yeah. Regardless of anything else. Like we're not running the numbers every day or something like that. Regardless of anything else, it's a, it's, it's a great time with uh, us three friends who we've known each other for forever. Aaron's my cousin, so we've known each other our whole life. Mm-hmm. We've known Greg since the early 90s. So it's it's just hanging out. And we happen to record it. <laughs> and so you guys, you mentioned other bands. You guys always play music together? All three of you? Or yeah, just yeah. Forge and Decibel was all... I guess in Forge, we've had, we, we, did a, we had a couple different drummers, but Greg was the original drummer. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, he came back and he was the drummer when the band finally quit. Um, but yeah, we, we had a couple of other, other drummers in, in, in Forge. But mm-hmm. in all the other bands, it's only been Greg. So, That's cool. yeah, yeah, we got a long musical history together, for yeah. sure. <laughs> and those bands are rock-based, too? Yeah, Forge was like uh, little sprinkles of, like, Helmet, sprinkles of, like, Thin Lizzy, especially at the end when we got a second guitar player for the last record. We had yeah. some guitar harmonies going on. But the first two are more raw, like, Sort of punk meets hard rock, I guess, uh, and, and comic books, a lot of comic book vibe with lyrics and stuff. When did you do Forge? Well, uh, from, yeah. from 1994 until 2003. Okay. Sounds three three like full-length albums. Really familiar to me, and I used to go to like so many shows around that time when I was a teenager. Yeah, did you ever go to the Wired Frog and oh, stuff like that? We played uh, the Wired okay. Frog all That's the time. That's why I'm like, Forge, Forge, yeah. I, know, I know. Our buddies were like arising and... Sometimes Factory 81 in the oh, early days. And yep, I remember that. Who else do we play with? Pooch we played with a lot of times. Um, man, so many of those bands. I can't even remember all their names, but there's so many yeah. of that like scene on, on the east side here. And they were all younger than us by a handful I was of say, years. There was a few people, a few of my friends who were always in different bands. Uh, Mad Cow, and then they turned into Megatron. Okay. Um, uh I, I like Megatron better, by the way. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, oh, this as far as names oh. go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is a better name. Uh, there was a band that uh, I, I it was Friends of Friends, Dead by 28. Oh, I remember those Gothic. guys. I, yeah. I remember those. Actually, that guy didn't like us for some reason. I have no idea why he didn't. He might not have liked our one drummer, but mm-hmm. we never did shit to him. But for mm-hmm. some reason, that I forgot his name now, but... I don't think he liked us. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then what was the other band? I don't know. I had a friend who was in like a bunch of different bands, so I can't think of any of the names of the bands right now. Yeah. Maybe it's best I'm embarrassing. But, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Decibel was like 70s rock, mm-hmm. straight up. Like it was still all original stuff, but that was more like early Van Halen and Thin Lizzy and... Like Ted Nugent riffs, not mindset. <laughs> and... Uh, Stuff like that, you know, that, that that was the spirit of that band. But it was weird but because because I took it 
a little bit differently. And I don't know if, if it made it weird or not or made it cool or not, but I wanted to play bass because I played bass in Forge and Destiny Built, not keyboards or synthesizers at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted the bass playing from Forge to Destiny Built to be a complete 180. So in Forge, I played fretted Music Man Stingrays, very gnarly, like Pantera style or helmet with distortion and overdrive and just gnarly. I even did a lot of chords in that band, especially before we got the second guitar player because I was trying to fill space. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in Decibel, I played a fretless Fender Jazz and no overdrive and played mm-hmm. with my fingers instead of a pick. I don't mm-hmm. even get more different than that. Yeah. I just made it. I made, I made myself do that. Like I want to chart new ground and not have the band sound at all alike as much as possible because mm-hmm. it was all the same people still. So yeah. I'm trying to think of everything possible to like make it really be different. And of course, Voyager 3, there's no bass except for, you know, synth bass right. and no vocals. And it's a whole other mindset. There's no traditional song structure most of the time. No verse, chorus, verse stuff. I mean, sometimes there is still no vocals, though, but uh-huh. it's just a whole very big departure, obviously. I love how you're in the third iteration of this. Third yeah. different, like, I mean, subgenre of rock, Voyager 3. Yeah, yeah, three of us in the band, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's perfect. Yeah, perfect. you're picking perfect up. Trilogy. You're picking it up. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you as a solo artist, you also uh, you kind of mentioned that earlier when we were talking about uh, Porter to Hell. You come do film scores and compose. Yes, music indeed. On yeah, your own. yeah. The so it all this whole thing, Voyager three included, started from. Uh, a time when after Decibel broke up, there was no music happening at all. And I, I, I texted Greg one day. And I'm like, Greg, I want to do this really weird band with no vocals, uh, like soundtrack music. And I'm going to play synths. I'm not even going to play bass. Is that something you think you'd want to do? Because before I sent that text, I thought I was just going to be doing this by myself. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. I, I just assumed that those guys were like, no, dude, we, we want to play rock and roll like we were doing, and this is too weird. So mm-hmm. I assume that. Mm-hmm. But after I asked Greg, he was like, yeah, dude, I'm all about it. Uh, and then I still didn't – you think I would have learned my lesson, and I would have been like, well, let's call Aaron. But yeah. I'm like, Aaron's not going to want to do this. I still doubted it for some reason. So yeah. we even had another guitar player come out one time just to jam and see. But you know when the when the mojo is not right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, no hard feelings or anything like that. It's just that person's not the right gel, yeah. you know, for what's going on. So then I, te- I texted or called Aaron. I'm like, Aaron, man, I want to do this thing. He's like, dude, yes. So then not that much longer, we actually wrote the first two songs, which are on our very first seven inch that we did called Victory in the Battle Chamber. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the B side is Hunted Becomes Hunter. That came up pretty quick. Um, but then I-, I knew that I still wanted to do kind of really weird stuff, mm-hmm. more spacey, if you will, or not necessarily space, but just more weird mm-hmm. that had more... Um, texture to it and not not necessarily room for a guitar or traditional drums like playing a beat all the time like a drummer would want to do typically right um so i still had in my mind i'm going to still do this more weird stuff by myself that's that's definitely not like voyager 3 and just more airy and and crazy (laughs) so uh i I have a couple of solo records uh the first one is called um electronic dreams for a holographic existence. Mm-hmm. And that one's very fun. I, I play saxophone on a couple songs and it's all synth uh, otherwise. Um, and then the second record that I did is pretty special to me. It's kind of personal slash sort of unique, I guess. I mean, it's not like it's never been done before, but mm-hmm. I don't hear a lot of people doing this. But uh, we took a family vacation to Hawaii. I think this is 2017 or 18, one of the two. And uh, I brought, I, I had this idea that I wanted to, do a record in Hawaii because you don't get to Hawaii too often. Right, yeah. And it's really, I'm, I was assuming at the time because I'd never been, got to be inspiring because it's like another land basically, mm-hmm. right? Even though it's still our country, but it's just different. Mm-hmm. I, I've watched Lost. I know it looks different. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so I said, well, I can't fit a studio on carry-on baggage on a plane. So I, I, ha- I had two real small synths, this uh, Arturia Micro Brute, which is really small. Uh, but it has all c- controls on it. It's not presets. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it lets you be able to do whatever you want in the world of synthesis. And then, and then this, uh, this, uh, Dave Smith Tetra, which is polyphonic because the, the mini or the micro brute is monophonic, meaning only one note at a time. 
So I needed something I could play chords on too. Mm-hmm. So I brought this little Tetra. It's like this little box and there's no keyboard to it at all. It's just a, like an, an engine, a yeah. sound engine with some controls, not many. Because that would fit in the suitcase. And I'm like, well, I got to have one cool effect. It's got to be delay. So I had a delay pedal. That fit right by my socks. <laughs> so I put that in there. And then I brought a laptop because I had to record it to something. Yeah. So I had this old white plastic MacBook. I'm surprised it worked even. And I think I recorded it in Ableton, I think. I didn't even know how to work it at the time because my Pro Tools license didn't work in Hawaii because I thought I could transfer it from my studio computer to my laptop and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I guess I have to use Ableton. <laughs> so on the fly, I'm just like making it happen. Is but, it like an open source software? Or? Uh, no, Ableton is its own thing. It's kind of okay. like Pro Tools. It's, it's a DAW that is made by a manufacturer. It's just more loop-based and it's made for more like live performance oh, okay. rather than like linear recording. Even though when you okay. f- hit a key command, it switches and you are doing linear recording, but you can record like loops and then trigger them back if you have a special control interface. Uh, it's really cool that tool actually, mm-hmm. but it does record, and that's all I need to do is just capture all of the stuff that was coming to me in this crazy place that I was at because it was yeah. awesome. Um, so I think it's how many songs is it? Is it five songs? It's some amount of songs, five, five or six songs, and I recorded that over three nights mm-hmm. after the kids went to bed, and I, I took a dip in the pool. I got out and and recorded these handful of tracks. And then, I did, and then I didn't think about it again. I closed it down. Oh, I also brought one of those little handheld recorders, like those Zoom recorders you see reporters have to mm-hmm. interview somebody. Mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to get the sounds of Hawaii. Rain dripping, a waterfall, the, the animals, the waves of the ocean. I got all that stuff um, just with this little Zoom handheld mm-hmm. recorder thing. Um, and then I, I mixed it a few weeks after we got home. I wanted to like disconnect from it. Uh, and right. There was this cool metal table in the living room and all the percussion you hear is just me hitting with my hand or I got a wooden spoon from the drawer mm-hmm. at, in the house and hit it and then you know just kind of placed it where it needs to go it was fun so that's my second album is I just wanted to capture Hawaiian inspiration wow. yeah. that's really cool <laughs> yeah yeah and uh oh so Portal to Hell was awesome to score that um you know doing what I do or what anybody doing what I would what, what what I do would, would want to see is somebody famous on screen when you're working. Oh, well, yeah. how about Roddy Piper? <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was so really cool. awesome to do that. Loved it. It, and, it made it easier maybe because you're like pumped. Yeah. You know, oh my god, I definitely have to do this scene justice. Jesus Christ, you know, and you're and you're thinking of the best things you can think of. <laughs> you know, that's really cool. I don't uh, know the first thing about writing or recording music, but you know, I love film and I love making movies. Yeah, and music is. So important. Score yeah. is so important to, to film. It makes, weirdly, it makes it realistic. Yeah, yeah. And um, to, like, hear your uh, take about your uh, role in filmmaking is really cool. I love it. Thanks. Like, I relate, even though I don't know anything about... Right, right. It's just you know? one other branch off the main tree that you're on. Mm-hmm. It's, this is one just right over here. Yeah. But it's very close to really and, and, you know, it's it's just part of the reason I love filmmaking so much because it's all these different disciplines, all these different types of create, creative thought, and then also, like, technical stuff, too. Yeah, oh, all yeah. All in one. Yeah. So, yeah, I love it. That's what For movies sure. I love, movies and filmmaking. Um. So... Also, Solo, you have your own podcast you just started. Yeah, I did. <laughs> called Roasted Spins, and you have one episode out right now. Yes, I'm going to try to do another one in the next two days. I have a really good coffee for this one. It's one of my favorites, so I've been saving it. I didn't want to do it first. Yeah. I wanted to like ramp up to it. But yes, um, it's, it's awesome. It's fun, and I love a good cup of coffee, and I love music, obviously. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I kind of have always been doing Roasted spins, if you think of it, because like on any given morning when I have time, I'll brew a cup of coffee and put a record on. Well, now I'm just talking about it in Mm -hmm. front of a camera. So Mm -hmm. it's like, it kind of made sense to do that. Um, I know a lot of people like coffee and a lot of people like music. So I'm kind of just basically sharing my journey because I'm not a coffee expert Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I I only just recently found out that my cheap espresso maker, that's called, I think it's called a a, a SoCal. It's like 60 bucks on Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's not a real espresso maker. Because I didn't know about the nine or five bars of pressure that mm-hmm. espresso. I just found out about that like 10 days ago. <laughs> so I am not a coffee expert. Yeah. I just know 
that I like something when I taste it. So I'm kind of coming at this as a layman mm-hmm. and relaying it to whoever cares about it and sharing, hey, this is a good cup of coffee, and I explain what I think it is. And I, I do relay some of the package information because mm-hmm. that's a standard yeah. that people who do know about coffee will know dark roast, light roast, or what part of the world, mm-hmm. like if it's an Ethiopian, for mm-hmm. example, that has a certain typical flavor. So I do relay that so that some people who do know things can relate, I guess. But I'm no expert. I'm learning as I go. And it's a fun journey. You sound like you know what you're talking about. I mean, you did a really good job of describing the coffee. I, I never had the coffee you described. Yeah, yeah. It, I, like, got uh, an idea of it. Oh, good. That's the mission, I, I wouldn't then. have known that you didn't know anything. Oh, wow. Okay. You shouldn't have said anything. You could have tricked us all. <laughs> right, right. I showed my cards, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, something I, I personally really like about this podcast is it's it's about five minutes. Right, and right. And we have a really short attention span. So even podcasts, I genuinely am very interested in and like um i can't like a, an hour long one i have a really hard time like following i agree i agree i, yeah. I even kept that in mind with this one and if you notice the edits are very fast and mm-hmm. i don't leave any dead space it's mm-hmm. it's almost like i could i could even imagine even somebody typing in the comments well you really like that coffee don't you because i'm <laughs> like i'm like really quick and it's cut really quick but that's just intentional yeah. to keep that pace going and so that it can be as short a podcast as possible because I, I, I want to give the info yeah but it's different than like v3cast where we're kind of like hanging mm-hmm. and we still try to keep that moving along too by the way but those always end up being like 45 minutes up to maybe an hour and we definitely don't want to go over an hour mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. we can at all help it mm-hmm. so we, we always have that in mind but with roasted spins i'm really Trying to yeah. keep that peppy. For I sure. mean, I like. I thought the pace was really good, but I am always very caffeinated and drinking coffee, right so that might just be the like good caffeine caffeinated, you know, pace. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm excited to hear more. Oh, I think you'll like the one. We'll talk about this at, at, after the show, but yeah. uh, I'll tell you the one I'm going to do on the next one for sure. Yeah, I um, after I was done listening to that, I wanted to listen to that record and drink that coffee. Nice. So okay. It was a oh, that pace. record is killer. Oh yeah. my god. Death Wish soundtrack, Herbie Hancock. It's so good, honestly. I never, I've never seen uh, Death Wish. I don't know. I haven't. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's fun too. I mean, if you like a revenge film, yeah. I mean, it's cool for sure. I get the mood. Charles Bronson, man, yeah. is the ass mean, kicker. When you get in the mood for something like that, they're like really cathartic and fun. Something like yeah, that. yeah. And uh, it, it does fit well with the theme, kind of, of New York Ninja, which you mentioned on the podcast. Right, too. right, right. So, um, what's next for? Uh, Voyager. Well, actually, we're going to play a really cool show at Comics and More, which is in Madison Heights. It's a comic book shop that my Mm -hmm. friend Chris Brown owns. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be not officially coincided with because I don't think the author is going to be there or anything like that. But there's a sequel to New York Ninja in a comic book form. Oh, I've heard of this, yes. Yes, and it comes out November 30th. um, And uh, Chris Brown at Comics and More is going to order a bunch of copies in. And on December 3rd, which is a Saturday, in the afternoon, it's going to be an early show, mm-hmm. all ages and a free show. Mm-hmm. I think we go on at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We're going to play a set in the comic book shop. Well, that's uh, awesome. We're going to play some songs from all of our records, including New York Ninja. Yeah. So um, that's our next thing that we're going to do. That's sure. really cool. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to make it out to that. It's yeah. December 3rd. Yeah, okay, yeah. we got time to plan. What better place to be than seeing a band... That's playing that kind of stuff. If you're in the comic book shop, you're probably going to like that bubble of stuff, right? Oh, yeah. And then you can pick up the latest issues that you've been missing on a few of your titles. He has posters, vintage toys. He even has a punch-out machine, arcade, old-school oh, punch-out sweet. machine in there. I hope it works. His last time I was in there, it wasn't working. <laughs> Fix it. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, that's great because I have kind of been looking for an excuse to go out and visit there. I haven't been there. Okay. Um, because I don't really get out on that side of... Uh, the city or town that much. Yeah, I hear you. Um, because we have a, a couple cool ones around here, like on Gratiot, there's one and stuff yeah. like that. So yeah, I, I, I'm the same way. I kind of stick around my local bubble a lot, but I'll venture out sometimes for sure. Yeah, we, we used to like to go to um, Comics Corner and Frasier and Liberty Comics. That's in, in this okay. area. But yeah, I really want to get out there because it seems like a really cool store. Yeah, yeah. It's so, a lot of fun. That'll be a, a, a awesome uh excuse to do that yes indeed um what about in with your your solo stuff i do have a finished record 
that is read to go. Well, I don't have art for it, but mm-hmm. I don't know what I want to do with that yet. So yeah, I might. It might be one of those things where all of a sudden I just put it out there really quickly, mm-hmm. or maybe not. I'm not sure yet. But I do have one ready to go, and mm-hmm. it's uh, it's a little bit different vibe than the previous two. It actually incorporates like some orchestral stuff, like like or- orchestra samples that you can play, like uh, you know some of the Spitfire stuff mm-hmm. or. Uh, Who's another company that does that? Uh, like East West has orchestra samples and percussion. Um, you know, the, the computer music people know about these things. But uh, uh, mm-hmm. I incorporated that. So it's like synth and some orchestra, too. I kind of oh, did a little hybrid yeah. of that. So um, I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but it'll be out soon enough. <laughs> cool, cool. I'll look forward to that. Yeah. Uh, do you, you take, like, uh, I guess... I don't know, jobs is the right word, or gigs or whatever from uh, filmmakers, like now, like any independent Oh, filmmakers. all the time, yeah, yeah. Um, a whole range of um, of things that I do. Uh, for, for example, I master people's records, mm-hmm. unrelated to anything that I've done. To, you know, it's not my project. They'll just give me their record to master, and then they release their record. Mm-hmm. Um, I've mixed yeah. stuff for people. I have collaborated with people. Um a good example is a band, I think they're from British Columbia, they're called Swamp Music Players, and mm-hmm. they wanted like a 80s, maybe like a little bit like Blondie, kind of 80s style, retro style song, and I just got like an acoustic guitar playing the chord structure of the song, and like an open mic recording of the guy just kind of playing drums, just to give me like the chord structure and the vibe, but the vocals were the keeper, because mm-hmm. the vocals were the, the, the point of it, mm-hmm. and they go... Here's the chorus structure and seven lists of our inspiration and the vocals. Make us a, a '80s era pop song. So I did. I, I, every I, everything was wow. it was deleted off of that thing except for the vocals and and I, I replaced the whole thing with it. So I've done that before. Um, I'll score somebody's film or the band will, depending on logistics and time mm-hmm. and budget and who's available and what kind of vibe they want. You know, it kind of kind of goes through the interpretation filter and then pointed in the direction that makes sense for whatever is needed, you know, because not everything uh, would work for the whole band and vice versa. You know, not Mm -hmm. everything would work um, just for a solo guy, maybe. So it's a, it just depends. Um, I'll mix something for somebody. Um, I've also been contracted to do like background tracks for uh, a company that's going to use them uh, for like interviews and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just whatever. Sometimes it's like genre film stuff or sometimes it's corporate Stuff like a company starting, like a legal company I've done stuff for where they talk about the product and it's a very like business voiceover and I've done some yeah. orchestra stuff behind that. So it's, it's whatever. It, it's all fun to me basically. And it's, wow, and, and you're all cool. going on a mission to like help tell the story, even if it's a commercial, still mm-hmm. a story going on to some degree for sure. Of course. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. Thanks about for having me. This, this is awesome. Stuff. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm like, legit excited about that uh, comics and more show yeah it's gonna be third. great that's i love that fun. store yeah um i'm excited about it so um maybe we'll see some of you guys who are viewing there too so thank you again steve it was a joy all right thanks for having me of course have a good night everyone <laughs>